Oh, this is Western. 11 honors. Yes. So. Yeah. All right, so let's read it, answer the questions, and then I'll give you the notes. Um, can you give me the questions that we should ask a poet? Give me one of them, Isabella. Like what every poem you read, you should ask this question before you think before you can interpret it. I always start with the speaker. Alright, so what would come next or if the first one is the speaker, the second one should be so they're, um, addressing it to Right. Them? And sometimes it's nobody but us, but sometimes it is somebody other than us. Sarah, give me a third question. All right, the setting and the equation. Like, where are we? Where are we literally? What's happening literally in the poem? Is it night and day? Whatever, anything like that may be significant. Um, then we go to the, you know, what else? Those are kind of the basic four or five questions. But then you go to questions like, what is the tone? Like, what is the purpose? Um, and then you eventually end up looking at the literary devices, like the ones on the board to help you understand what he's trying or she's trying to say. And you ultimately end up, what is the poem about? But then you ask, what, what is the meaning of the poem? So, um, Sarah, would you read this poem? I like to see it loud and mild. The first word of the title and the first word of the poem gives us an answer to Isabella's first question is, who's the speaker? Uh, the speaker is, ah, whoever. So, Sometimes it's the poet, you know, somebody like the poet, but this is somebody she uses ah, and that's important. Yeah. Um, I like to see it laugh the mild and lift the valleys up and softly feed itself at turns and then prodigious, prodigious, prodigious. step around a pile of mountains, a super, super silas mm -hmm. clear and shanties by the side of her and then a query. Go Go Angie. Yeah, okay. Then punctual are the stars, soft and do docile. I can't speak today. Docile. Docile and omnipotent at its own stability. All right, now I want you to read it yourselves. Thank you for reading. Read it again one more time. All right, so let's answer the question, who's the speaker? So what do you know about the speaker, um, Delaney? Is it her? Because it says I. Yeah, um, but don't ever, I said it a minute ago, it slipped. I didn't mean to say that the, the speaker should never be exactly the same as the poet. All right, so, um, you know, exactly the same because we saw other, the other day, we saw that she couldn't be dead because even though she was talking an I, because the person in the poem speaking died. Um, what, what do you know about this speaker? Isabel, what do you know about this speaker? All right, 
Uh, what's what's he talking about? What's she talking about? Well, she, she spends four paragraphs talking about something. Um, and what does she like about this something? Like, what does she say she likes about it? Sarah, do you see, what, what, even in the first line, what does she like about it? Not yeah, she likes to see it. So it's something you can see. It's not like death, it's not like love. You can't see death or love, um, but whatever this is, you can see it. So our, one of the jobs in this poem is to figure out what it is she likes to see, what she's talking about. Um, look at the question. I'm going to give you this, these definitions just to save us some time. So circle these words um, in the first stanza, prodigious. Pro Prodigious means extraordinary in size or degree. So let, before we go on, what does that tell you about the thing she likes to see, if it's prodigious? It's large. Uh, and it prodigiously steps. So what does that tell you about it? This is like a big riddle. The poem is a riddle. But what, do you, what does it mean when it says it steps in an extraordinary degree? It travels, it moves. So whatever she likes, it moves and it's big. Do um, you see anything else in the first stanza that might reveal what it is? Um, you think the thing is water. Why do you say that? So it moves, and it can move. It's got a powerful movement. But look at the first stanza again. It says, um, it stops to feed itself at tanks. So it, sound, what, it sounds like the thing that it is is feeding itself. Water I wouldn't necessarily need to be fed. And tanks seems to me, what do you put in tanks? Kind of things go in tanks. They have to do with travel. Um, tank, T A N K S, like oh, something that boats. travels. What? Boats. I don't know. What did you say? Like tanks? Like well, military tanks? Well, it feeds itself at tanks. So it's, it seems like things that travel have to have some source of fuel. Now, again, we're, we're just putting water on on the side right now. This thing seems to need water or some sort of fuel that feeds itself. Well, let me finish the question. Uh, look at question, like supercilious. Uh, so find the word supercilious. That means uh, acting superior or haughty. Yes. You're, you're getting in the right direction now. You're, you're on the right track now. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Forgive me for what I just said. I said she was on the right track. Sorry. It just literally slipped out. The word track slipped out. It's a train. It is a track. And so I, I, let, I let it slip out. That didn't mean what I was trying to say. You're, you're in the right direction. Yeah, it is a train. And we can sort of prove it now. Um, Super serious means haughty. Let me just finish defining the words. Uh, uh, pair. Do you know what it means to pair something? P-A-R-E is a verb. It means to, um, to trim. Like you could pair somebody's hair, you trim it. It used to be used to, instead of people cut their nails, they pair their nails. You don't cut it all off, you trim it off. Um, so whatever this is, pairs, and then boandrony with a capital B. Uh, this is a biblical reference to the apostles John and James, the two brothers. Jesus called them 
sons of Boandrines, and I think it's, I don't know what the word is, Greek or, or, or Hebrew, it's got to be Greek. Well, no, they didn't speak Greek. Anyway, whatever word, whatever language, it means thunder. So he called James and John the uh, sons of thunder. All right, so let's go back um, and figure out why do we think it's a train. All right, so do you take everything, and I'm just, we already got that out, it's a train. What makes, what now you see that, where's the, what's the evidence that it's a train? Of course, it feeds at tanks. It, it re requires requires fuel. What were the what was the fuel for trains in 1800? What was the kind of train that they had? What what made it move by itself? Steam. So they needed water. They needed water uh, to create the steam. Of course, they had fires on board, and it's a prodigious step. Um, what else? Can you look at what else is it? indicate that it would be a train. Around the pile of mountains. Like right. That's, that's where it's going. Right. But it also says that, um, and then a quarry pair, a quarry is a, um, is a rock, you know, where rocks are, it's a rock. Where else can trains go? It says around the mountains, where else can they go? They go through mountains. How can they go through mountains? How do trains go through mountains? Tunnel. Tunnel, all right. Um, to fit its ribs and crawl between, and then a quarry pair to fit its ribs and crawl between. That would suggest that it's going through some narrow passage. And then how does it complain in hooting stanzas? How does a train complain in hooting stanzas? The horn, the, the steam horn. Um, and then it neighs like thunder, that would be the horn. And it's punctual as a star at its own stable door. Where do trains stay at night? They used to stay at night. They do have stables for trains. If in a train yard, you can, it's like, uh, like airplane hangers. They can put a train, a locomotive in there to work on it. All right, so it's a train. Um, all right, look at uh, question number two. Let's see, uh, five, nine, twelve, I gotta keep this, in. okay. The poem, remember one of the questions you asked with poetry is, like, what are the devices that are used? That helps us appreciate the poem and understand it. So in line two, um, explain the figure of speech and lift the valleys up. What do we mean by figure of speech? Um, you know, language can be one of two things. It can be literal or it can be figurative. What does it mean to be literal? Yeah. What? It's like speak what you see. The, the words mean literally what I'm saying. If, if I'm saying, you know, people say they use that wrong. It, it was literally raining cats and dogs outside. What's wrong with that statement? Mm -hmm. it, it, it contradicts itself. We know that cats and dogs don't fall from the sky. And yet you said literally. Um, so literal language is not what we're talking about. We're talking about figurative language. What is the, explain the figurative language in line two and lick the valleys up. What does he mean by that? How does the train lick the valleys up? What do you think that's a reference to? This is, this is where my AP students also, they get really, they don't like this part of the poetry. They don't like looking at these little figures and trying to figure out what they mean. And yet this is where, at least in their case, they have to write papers on poetry at the end of the year on the AP exam. Um, this is where you make your, your, your grade, your A, is if you can do this. So someone think about it. How does a train lick a valley up? What do you think that's a reference to? Not literal. And, and yet, why is that an appropriate picture? It takes up the, what do you mean it takes up the land? Like, the, like I don't know, like, I don't know how to say it. It just takes up the space. Like, it, yeah, 
that. You see it going down a hill or going, it's like it's eating it up or something. It just, it seems it's a kind of odd image. I'm not sure I see it completely, but it's going so fast. It just, it, it's not slow. It's not chewing it. It's licking it. It's like really fast on the surface. Um, we'll do, we'll do several of these. Look at line nine, uh, to fit its ribs. And then acquire repair to fit its rib. What are the ribs of a train? And what did we say this is a picture of? Like, think of a tunnel. The train's going through the tunnel, and it says it, and to, it, it, it pairs a quarry to fit its ribs and crawl, bet crawl, crawl between, complaining all the while. So, you know, if you're going to put a, a, a steam engine, it's got bolts and rivets. You got to piece the pieces together, and they probably resemble ribs in a body. So, you know, it's, it it makes it more alive, doesn't it? It has ribs. It licks something. It peers. These are all examples. When you say it peers, what are you saying? About it? When you peer, what do you do? You what? Yeah, so why do you think he's describing the train? It's, it's got this big light on the front of it, and it says it peers in shanties. Have you ever been in your house at night? When I was a kid, this fascinated me, and you see the headlights from a car outside shining into your house. Has ever, you ever seen that? Of course you have. And, you know, I've always wondered who that is. We, we live right in front of a driveway. You know, we have houses here. So the, they're back, they're coming out this way, their light goes right into our house if we don't pull the blinds or whatever. Um, so that's how the train can do. They've got this big, why is making it human, like it, it's peering, or maybe just animal? Why is it appropriate to make it sound like it's alive when it's not? It's a machine. Because it moves. Yeah, and it, does it help us appreciate it better? I always think that personification is good because the speaker is making something not human, human, right? In that personification, isn't it? You, you talk about something that's not a human being and make it seem like a person. And I can always appreciate something if I can relate it to myself. And so the, the author, I think, is trying to relate it, the train, to us if, we, if it describes it in human, human terms. Um, and then why don't we do one more? Um, how about, I mean, you get the idea. How about 16? You get that one, but the very last line, uh, its own stable door. What, what does that make it sound like? You mentioned it from the beginning. Oh, Lord, did you know that the early trains were called the iron horse? They were called iron horses because they were compared to trains, I mean, to horses. So anyway, um, that's that's what he's do she's doing and um, again why because it, I think it makes us appreciate it I don't see a deep theme here do you do you see a deep meaning I don't it's just a fun poem I mean you may not think it's fun but I think she had fun describing this thing I do want to point out one or two things look at question number three. Um, the major, this, the major image here is of sound. One of the major images is the sound. One of the senses that the poem appeals to is sound. Why would it be appropriate for a train? Okay, so let's look at the sounds in the poem. Um, do you see examples of alliteration? Just shout it out, circle it, label it. Look, at, look for examples of alliteration. one major one in the third stanza. Do you see it? Horrid and hooting. Remember why is he include or she including uh, alliteration in order to make it sound like something. So horrid and hooting. Um, do you see any others? Look at the first line. 
course, there's what, what, what letter is repeated there? I like what? Seven. Yeah, I like to see it last in miles and lift the valleys up high. Do you know what assonance is? Do you remember what assonance is? Assonance is repetition of vowel sounds. Look at that first stanza. Look at the first word. Ah. Okay, do you see other I sounds? You know, an I can sound like it, or I guess other, but I as the I sound. Do you see other words that have that sound? Let me show you, and then I can get you to look for something. Circle these words. I like mild. I like, do those three words wrong? They don't wrong, but they, they, they share assonance. They share the I sound. Um, I right, look at the I sound, like I like, you see it, circle that, lick, and itself, and prodigious. You see, you hear the I sound of the I, the letter I? Those are sounds that you don't pick up consciously, but you pick up some subconsciously. They're kind of subtle. You notice it. Um, you're a singer, don't you sing? Somebody in here sing. You sing. I know you sing. Have you ever heard a quartet? I'm not a quartet, but just a, a choir or a group singing. And you hear, you can barely distinguish the parts, but you, they're there. Like it, it's a full sound, but the, the closer you listen, you pick up the bass sound, you pick up the tenor for a male, you pick up the lead, you pick up the uh, baritone. You, they're very close, but they all together, they blend together. That's the way poems are. They have these different sounds that the author incorporates in it to create a sound that you just hear the, the, the big sound. But as a student of poetry, sometimes your job is to die, I hate to use the word dissect it, but to try to distinguish between the individual sounds. Uh, look at the second stanza. Right, you can, I need for you to be able to define alliteration, which you know. Assonance, now you know. And consonance. You know what consonance is? It's the repetition of consonant sounds. All right, not vowel sounds, that's assonance. Look at the second stanza. Look at the third. Um, well, let me just read the whole stanza. I want you to circle the S sounds in this stanza. Around a pile of mountains and supercilious pier and shanties by the sides of roads, and then a quarry pair. Did you notice how many S sounds there were? Mountains, super cilious, shanties, sides, and roads. Um, like she has words like shanties and sides that has, has a alliteration and, and consonants. The, the, the S is at the beginning of the word and at the end of the word. So that's how that's how it works. And did you notice any rhyme? Well, I don't see rhyme, but notice the second stanza appear in pair. And and I just hope if you don't care, we're gonna, you know, I'll ask you these questions later, maybe on a test. But I just want you to realize that these are not accidents. The author didn't accidentally put those words together. She, on purpose, put them together. Sometimes they have happy accidents, like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize I did that. But these are pros. She's one of the greatest poets America's ever produced. She knows what she's doing. She picks these words for these sounds. And she's really just having fun with them. Um, you know, she, she's, she's not, in this case, trying to come up with some big meaning Although I like that, I like when she does that, but here she's just having fun with a, um, with a train. And it's entertaining. All right, so good job with that. We're gonna do a couple more of these. I would like to finish by giving you the rest of these notes, which we think we have notes on Walt Whitman. I'm pretty sure I gave you notes for that. But we don't have notes for Emily Dickinson. Um, uh, I don't think we have one for Whitman. So okay, we'll we call start, back. Can we start with Emily? Yes, yes, oh yeah, I, that's what I'm going to do. 
I said, the, the woman that we did these poems, the two poems about death, and said, there's all this woman I'm going to tell you about. Her name's Emily Dickinson. Do you know anything about her? No one knows anything about her. She's interesting. I don't know what your Im impression of writers are, that they're boring, maybe, I don't know. But this one is interesting. I think you'll find her interesting. So this is Emily, you know, I'm leaving the lights on because you can't pick it up. Um, if I don't record this, I'll get out of the habit. I'm, I'm doing this as much for me. All right, so she was born in Amherst, Massachusetts, basically spent her entire life there. We, I think we did one slide yesterday, so some of you may have this. She's from a prominent family. You don't need to know all that about them. Um, she had a brother, sister, father. I like the last statement. Oh, um, her brother and sister were her best friends in her life. Do you know anything about the um, Bronte sisters? They were close friends. They had a brother. They were really close, the two sisters and the brother. Uh, that's an interesting story. I'll share sometime. Um, but her mother was passive where everybody else was forceful. So her mother was kind of in the background, in the shadows, Whereas everybody else was just really overachievers and outgoing and all of that. And it was he was a US congressman. So I mean he was pretty pretty significant, a state senator. Um, he was a treasurer of the college. She went to Amherst College too, by the way. Um, Emily Dickinson. And yeah, this is Massachusetts. All right, let me go on. Uh, actually, she didn't go there. She went to Mount Holyoke. Um, for one year, she has, she has spent her entire life at Amherst. So she didn't see the world. She didn't travel. She didn't go to college, really, um, except for one year, and that wasn't really a college. Uh, she lived in only two houses all her life. At age 18, however, she was more educated than most women and men of her day. She went to Amherst Academy. Every time I see that, I think of Colwell Academy. I feel very confident that you, you four ladies, or you could say that about you right now, that you're more educated than most men and women that are 17 years old at least. I think you, you have a really have had a really good education, and that should, you should be proud of that. We're proud of you and what you're going to become. And part of the reason I think is for Caldwell. I mean, Caldwell's helped you. It's helped helping my grandson. So I, I like that. I like the fact that that she was well educated. That's that's something to be thankful for. Also, like yourself, she's a genius. You know, there are rare geniuses in the world. I'm, I'm sure you have some genius in you. I would not know what a genius is like. I, all this is pretty normal. Um, oh, she said this. If I read a book and it makes my body so cold no fire can, can warm me, I know that it's poetry. That's a very famous definition. It's her own definition of poetry. And um, I don't know that I react that way to poetry. It, she did. I'm not sure I have. As much as I enjoy reading it with you guys. Um, but anyway, I, I like it. All right, her family was considered unusual. I think you have to be great, you have to be unusual. If, you're, if you conform too much, you're probably not gonna be great, you know, because everybody 
just trying to be just like everybody else instead of being, you know, standing out. But Emily was the climax of all the family oddities, a myth, and the character of Amherst. They called her the myth because they weren't sure she really existed because they never saw her. She became a recluse. And it's a literary and historical mystery why. Nobody knows why. There are a lot of theories as to why. Maybe you can grow up and figure out what the reason she, she, there is speculation here that she fell in love with, with a publisher that was gonna publish her work and he dumped her. I think he was married. That's a good reason to dump her. But I'm not sure that. I just remember reading one time. It could have been a, a you know, broken heart type thing. But she disappears into the house and people never saw her. I have read this about her or heard this about her that when people would come over to visit the house, she would drop notes from the second, like the top of the stairs. She'd be listening up there and she'd drop a sheet of paper down the stairwell. It, it was her way of taking part in the conversation. They never saw her, they just you know, saw this note. Uh, that sounds really interesting. Weird, of course, but interesting. So you, whatever you, like to think you're welcome to it because nobody knows why she lived like that. You ever known a recluse or have you ever known an odd one? Like somebody in your neighborhood or even maybe a family member? I don't think I've ever, you know, the, the old guy that lives in the big house down there, you never see him, but you know, I think everybody grows, grows up. There's always somebody like that in the neighborhood. go on now. I'm not, I'm not rushing. I just, I'll put, I will post this as well. Alright. Remember I just said she's one of America's greatest poems, but she published fewer than a dozen poems in her lifetime. Um, and they were, they were edited. I have, I have looked, maybe I haven't looked hard enough, but I've seen examples of how editors took her poems and cleaned them up what I mean by cleaning them up, causing it to rhyme and, and not capitalize. She did have a lot of oddities in her writing. She would capitalize at odd places, punctuate differently. She would never rhyme or rarely rhyme in a normal sense. And apparently her first editors would just clean it up. They would make the words rhyme or they would put in normal punctuation. Uh, and then when she died, they found, and noticed 1886, 40 hand-bound volumes containing 1,800 poems, unpublished poetry. It would be like somebody rummaging through a house in England and finding five plays that Shakespeare wrote that no one's ever read or heard of. Um, I mean, that would be a huge literary discovery. Uh, her first volume of poems were published in 1890, and then the last in 1955, so I was just three years old when the last of her poems were published. It, it takes um, over 60 years to publish all her poetry. And it's important to remember that people did not recognize her as a great poet. I mean, she only published less than a dozen poems, so she was, she has become since the publication of all these, one of America's greatest poets, but she didn't know that. And yeah, you know, happens it happened to Chaucer. He was considered one of the greatest poets in British history, but I don't think he died knowing that. So what was? I don't remember exactly who it was. It was one of our students. He was a senior, and she posted something. I asked this question. And she posted something and she said she got half a million hits, what do you call it, likes. And, and then it was, John, I think it was Jonathan uh, Reynolds' brother. Is he, he had an older brother, doesn't he? Yeah. I, 
think it was him who posted something and he had over a million. Have you heard this story? I'm right, am I right about that? It was something probably silly, right? Um, that gives you, at least briefly, instant fame. And a lot of people want that. I, I don't think his brother, Jonathan's brother, did. But anyway, some people want to be famous. Anybody, do you want to be famous? What would be the downside of being famous? I mean, I guess we can think that everybody knows you and they want your autograph. What would be the downside of it? Your privacy. I mean, I cherish my privacy, and you probably do too. You don't have it if you're famous. Well, my point here is that she was told, she was not only not famous, no, hardly people knew that she existed because she had become a recluse. And then 100 years later, every, pers every person who's ever gone to school in the last 60 years knows the name of their movie. Every American who's ever been to school knows that name. She may be one of the most well-known literary figures in American history, um, but she never knew that. So she had fame, she just didn't ever know she was fame. And then I'll stop here. We've got five minutes. Um, all right, so she was, uh, yeah, you got to go. Yeah. I'm, I'm posting this, you can pick it up. Let's just get this last one. Um, she was influenced by religious, she had a religious background, and she was influenced by it. Very conservative Christianity, maybe like you, definitely like me. I, 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 I think Calvin had a lot of really important things to say. Um, she, look what else she read. These are the other things she read. Same things you've read. You've read Keats this year, Milton last year, Dickens. We're going to read Browning. We're going to read Tennyson and Longfellow. You've read Hawthorne. We have talked about Emerson and Thoreau. She's read the same things you've read. And they say that she had such a great education, so we must be doing something right if we're reading the same things that she did. And she started out as a musician. I don't know what she played, probably piano. So I think musicians and poets have a lot in common. All right, so we'll, we'll finish this um, uh, tomorrow, but um, remember you have some reading due for Tuesday, I believe it is, chapter 23 in the book. And I did post this.